Lord, we'll be just sitting in the sun, sitting pretty in the sun, <laughs> like we all like to do. Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Let's talk what's going on in the world today. The World Health Organization projected that COVID-19 deaths in Africa would fall sharply this year compared with 2021. We've talked a lot about this. It's the world's least vaccinated country. We're really surprised that you know, the death rate wasn't higher. Some speculation is because the country in general is a lot younger, but I have no idea why they're projecting it's going to fall. They just made it up. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, China finally has relaxed its pandemic rules. Uh, you know, they locked down uh, Beijing and Shanghai, and so now they're finally loosening up. Hopefully that'll help the world supply chain. And of course, officially England is now the party on country, because despite uh, <laughs> Boris, Boris's uh, parties and all that stuff, well, the lockdown and pandemic, uh, he survived his no confidence vote. I've got great, I have great confidence in Boris that if there's another pandemic, he'll be partying. And hopefully we'll all be invited. Uh, other travel news. For U.S. will now end uh, its COVID-19 test requirements for air travelers entering the country. Thank God, because I'm planning on going on vacation. Uh, probably it's a good idea to do that. I mean, we're the last country to do that. And Japan is finally beginning to uh, lift its travel restrictions starting June 10th. But I'm not so sure you want to go there. Because the new policies, of course, you have to have mandatory mask wearing. It, tourists going there have to remain with their hosts or tour guides you know, to make sure that they're being compliant. I'm not sure what they would do to you if you're not compliant. Uh, actually, they'll deport you is what they'll do. Uh, and they've been instructed to go to, go to in places where there are no people. <laughs> that's going to be fun. Go to one of the most populous countries and find somewhere where there's no people. But that's, you know, that's up to you and your travel agent. Uh, and, of course, if you don't comply with the rules, be deported. Uh, things are looking pretty good uh, in the rest of the world. If you look at the Western Hemisphere, U.S. is going up and Chile is still going up. If you look at Europe, however, the numbers are getting better. So Europe, Europe is coming down, as is um, sort of Southeast Asia. So both of those uh, areas of the world are improving. Uh, and worldwide, it looks like the cases are pretty flat. I showed you this last week. There's this little bump, but it seems to be like it's sort of, it's staying pretty, pretty stable. It's slightly up 1% increase in cases, but you know, not much. So what's going on in, in this country? Mostly flat. I mean, there's a lot of differences based on the region. About half the states are going up and about half the states are coming down. It was really high in the Northeast, was coming back down in the Northeast now. And so where is it high? It's in the South uh, and Midwest. Wyoming and Oklahoma are having outbreaks. Uh, it's about the same number of people uh, hospitalized. That's coming. That's been flat or declining slightly, uh, and so and and deaths are pretty flat. So I think, despite the fact that we've got a lot of virus around, uh, it's not impacting hospitalizations too much. And I'll go over some of the data locally for for that. If you look at the U.S. case rate, it really has plateaued. You can see this. It's it's really plateaued. There has been a slight increase. It was up about seven percent in case number. But we have no idea, honestly, what case numbers are because most of the people are testing at home, so we don't and not reporting it, so we really don't know. Uh, deaths have gone up slightly, about eight percent, but at 320, they're way, way down compared to the peak when we had 2,500 deaths a day. So, 300 a day is not good, but it's better than what it was. And if you look at the high, the heat map, I'd like to show this compared to how bad it was. Always could be worse. There was January of this year. But it's gotten a lot better, and you can see it got almost, it really was low in March. That was it when we sort of hit the nadir, and then it's been sort of coming up. And you can see now the hotter parts are in the Midwest and the West. So since we can't really follow case number very well, probably the best indicator of what's going on is wastewater. And there are four or five hot spots. So, and then there's one area that's going down. So you can see in the Northeast, New York City, and the Northeast, it's going down. Blue means it's falling uh, in, in viral burden. But Illinois, Wisconsin, we've been following those for a couple of weeks, are up. Colorado, uh, Wyoming, I mentioned, uh, California, and Oregon and Seattle. So those, those are going up. And here in Houston, even though the Texas numbers aren't all that bad, if you look at Houston, our wastewater numbers are going up. So you can see uh, we're now at 381% of our July 6th number. So it's almost tripled. So that means, you know, as long as the wastewater numbers are going up, we're going to continue to have cases. 
Now, the CDC is reporting, I gave you the website to go to look at your own community spread, but right now Harris County is running 212 per 100,000. Low risk is below 200, moderate's above 200, so we're above, slightly above 200. Same thing for hospitalizations. Below 10 is good, above 10, and we're at 12. So I'd say we're at moderate risk, kind of low moderate, but heading in the wrong direction. We're going to hold off our own institution on, you know, re reviving the mask mandates until it's, we know which way it's going. Right now it's still kind of low, so we're not re-implementing uh, mask mandates here you know, on, school, on the campus. There are, of course, in the hospital. And our friends in Dimmitt County, they're, they're also going up. Those javelinas must have returned. <laughs> Send the javelinas back home. Uh, it, interestingly enough, we've been talking about the, um, the, the variant. BA5 and BA4, remember the ones who were originally discovered in South Africa, are rising slowly, but they're rising. The original Omicron variant is gone, BA1. BA2 replaced it. That's disappearing. And now BA2.12, which is the one that replaced it, is sort of the dominant one. And if you look at BA4 and 5, this, as I say, the South African variant, where is the largest percentage? It's here in Texas. So interestingly enough, the largest percentage of that is in Texas and, and sort of the southeast, also in, in Florida. So, you know, it kind of suggests that because of travel, that, that's probably how it was introduced to our community, and it's, it, it is spreading. In the northeast, it's very very small amount. So it is definitely responsible for the spread in our community. Now, I've had a lot of people ask me, can I finally go back to the gym? I mean, I've been out of the gym. I've been a good person. Go back to the gym. So interesting study in the National Academy of Science, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, who well, tried to answer the question about exercise and aerosolization. <laughs> so they created a wonderful uh, way to do this. The generator of aerosols uh, went to a person on a bike uh, in a mask, and as they exhaled, they had a particle counter, so they could actually look at levels of exhaled particles uh, based on exercise. And this is what it looks like, whether you're trained or untrained, man or woman, when you exercise, it goes up pretty dramatically. And so it's, it's actually increasing exponentially as you move from moderate to uh, intense exercise. So I, I am not going back to the gym. I'm just telling you, I just run outside, be outside. But if you're in a closed environment with people who are exercising intensely, they are spewing aerosolized products all over. And you, all you need is one person who's infected and doesn't know it to spread it. So <laughs> if you go to a gym, best of luck to you. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. So there's a real interesting thing I want to show you, the waves of variants. And this, I talked about this last week in the wastewater from Minnesota, how these variant waves are, are happening and the differences between them. But this is a really good example. This is a, actually a publication of the Financial Times. But they looked at the ancestral, the, the very first, it was not the virus isolated in Wuhan, but the one that was transmitted to Europe, the first D614G mutation that made it more infectious. That's the one that eventually was the founder here also. And you can see that peak. And it was about four months before the alpha peak hit. And then about another five, four months, or five months before Omicron hit, or four months before Delta hit, and then five months before Omicron hit. And now the Omicron variants are, again, five months. So, you know, we like to think about an annual vaccine, but virus isn't behaving that way. The vi virus keeps changing every four to five months, which is why we're sent always sort of behind on our immune response and why we're going to need a polyvalent vaccine, one that has multiple versions of, of the virus, or a more universal vaccine. It, we can't, otherwise, we're just going to be chasing these variants around every four to five months. <laughs> it's not going to be an annual shot. It's going to be like a every six-month booster. And if you look at hospital admissions, this is really interesting. So in the, during the D614G, right, when there was no vaccine, it was mostly elderly that were hospitalized. Then there was, and, and, and then there was the alpha variant. Vaccines were approved right before the delta variant peak. And if you recall, we really vaccinated uh, the elderly. I mean, that was our first attempt to get most of the elderly over 65. <laughs> That's me. Jeez, oh, I'm going to start referring to them as the elderly. Billy, you too, you're too old. <laughs> but, but anyway, we started vaccinating people. And so this, in, when you look at who was admitted during the Delta surge, it was a mixed bag. It was young people, 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds, and 60-year-olds. 
But because their, our immunity began to wane when Omicron hit, and then we, again, we talked about this last week, this huge peak in hospitalizations was, again, mostly the elderly because it was a combination of a different variant that we weren't responding to, that we weren't vaccinated against, and the waning immunity from the vaccines. So even though there have been these hospital peaks that look about the same level, the first one was elderly, the second one was a mixed bag, and then the last one, Omicron, this last uh, winter has been really mostly elderly. So a lot of people have also asked me more a follow-up on the myocarditis. Well, really good study, very large study that was published in, uh, in circulation, looked at college athletes and not uh, the myocarditis from vaccination, but the myocarditis from the SARS-CoV-2 infection. Because that, you always have to look at it, you know, the vaccine versus getting the disease. And so they did a very large study, 3,600, uh, 3,675 athletes aged 20 years of age on average, 33% female, 64% or Caucasian, 27% black, representing 45 universities and 27 unique sporting disciplines, whatever that means. I guess curling was probably not one of those <laughs> disciplines. <laughs> uh, anyway, so they, they, uh, they did cardiovascular testing, electrocardiogram, they looked at troponins, which is an index of, of, um, of it's an enzyme in muscle cells that are released when it's injured, so myocarditis, echocardiograms, uh, uh, MRIs, and they did this on 97% of the athletes. And surprisingly, what they found in 21 of these athletes, that's 0.6%, they actually developed myocarditis from the infection of SARS-CoV-2. Now, you compare that to the myocarditis from the vaccine, it's not 0.6%, it's 0.001%, 12 in a million. So, again, more evidence that if there's any concern, if you should definitely get the vaccination. Now, no one died from the myocarditis in, from vaccination, no one died from the myocarditis uh, from, uh, from getting naturally infected, but 20, all those athletes were restricted from playing until they recovered. All right, some vaccine in the news. Uh, Moderna has planning a new uh, booster for the fall. They're targeting uh, one of the Omicron-specific uh, antigens this time. Uh, they say it produces 1.7 times as many neutralizing antibodies against the, this version of Omicron, but of course we don't know. Now we have B4 and B5, so we don't know if it'll h handle that. Uh, they looked at 437 uh, patients, and they, they suspected, or they, they stated, although I haven't seen the data, that it would pro provide longer lasting protection, but you know, who knows? We'll have to see the data. But at least they're talking about a, a new booster in the fall for the Omicron variant. Pfizer uh, announced in the World Economic Forum in Davos uh, that they're going to provide nearly two dozen products, including the COVID-19 vaccine, at not-for-profit prices. Now, that's not free, but it's at not-for-profit prices. To, uh, they want to improve health equity in 45 lower-income countries, including most of Africa, Haiti, Syria, Cambodia, and North Korea. So congratulations, Pfizer. Good idea. Probably be better if you provided it for free, but, you know. <laughs> Not for profit. <laughs> we're, we're also not for profit, so I know that business. <laughs> you don't make any money on that. Okay. Uh, and then a lot of new stuff on post-COVID, which is really interesting because another, I get tons of questions about, you know, the, the long COVID syndrome. So there was a really huge study that looked at electronic medical records from March 28th to November 2021. 63 million adult records, 110 different contributors in 50 states. And what they found was one in five people aged 18 to 64 and one in four aged over the age of 65 experienced at least one condition that you could attribute to COVID. So that's a huge amount. That's, that's what actually the UK has been uh, reporting, about 20, 25% of people who are infected have some long COVID syndrome. So that's something that lasts four weeks after. And so the, the CDC has actually come out with this, uh, you know, very, <laughs> this important announcement you know, one in five adults age 18 plus have health conditions that might be related to COVID. And there's all kinds of things, Neuro, neurologic, cardiovascular, respiratory, clotting, kidney failure, musculoskeletal conditions. They said talk to your health provider. That's one of the reasons we started a long COVID clinic. But if you have a symptom that you think might be related to COVID, talk to your health care provider. Don't, don't just sit around and feel like it's, you know, craziness. You might have something. So, uh, and we don't know a lot about it yet. So the more people who, you know, go to their physician, the more we'll know. So I want to end this week with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, congratulations to uh, Texas Children's Hospital on being ranked the number two children's hospital by U.S. News and World Report. 
in addition, they had 10 of their specialties uh, ranked within the top 10. Thanks to the leadership there and also the Baylor faculty and staff who take such great care of our uh, children, yeah, Texas Children's. This month we also celebrate Juneteenth and Pride Month. Uh, Juneteenth is a federal holiday and marks June 19th, 1865, the day that enslaved people in Galveston, Texas were told of their freedom two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. So it's a big uh, celebration of the end of slavery. I don't know why it took two and a half years to get to Galveston, but that's Galveston. Uh, this is also Pride Month, celebrated annually in June to honor the 1969 Stonewall Riots in New York that are regarded as a catalyst for the LGBTQ uh, movement. Uh, Pride Month also recognized the impact of LGBTQ individuals uh, have had on, in, in, on history nationally, locally, and globally. Uh, these are important reminders when we think about these two, uh, these two celebratory events that we at Baylor care a lot about diversity. We think it's a really important part of what we do, not because it's the right thing to do, which it is, but it also provides an advantage to have a diverse uh, population. And I want to end, well, before I go away, I want to end with my favorite painting, Circus. I have a lot of people who have asked me about this. This is by Albert Schubach. It's, it's entitled Circus. The reason I like it here in my office is because, you know, BCM stands for Baylor College of Medicine. Sometimes I consider it the Baylor Circus of Medicine, but, you know, it reminds me, it's always fun here at work. But Albert Schubach was born in Geneva in 1925. He died in 2008. He's recognized as one of the leaders of the French modern and post-war contemporary art movement, and there are over 100 uh, works of art by him in the Museum of Modern uh, Contemporary Art in Nice. Uh, what's cool about it, when, when he moved to France, his real, original name was spelled Schubach, S-C-H-U-P-B-A-C-H, uh, and he changed it to Schubach, C-H-U-B-A-C, when he moved to France, I guess, more accepted. Uh, but his, if you have a piece of work by him where, the, where it's signed by his original name, that's actually cooler. Uh, and this was one of the works when he passed away that was in his studio, so I was lucky to acquire that. Anyway, uh, have a great weekend, and I can't wait to see you.